This video is sponsored by NordPass. Keep watching or check the link in the video description to learn more. Hey there, and welcome back to RM Transit. When you think about historic rapid transit systems, you might think about the New York subway or the London Underground. But given its storied history and over 140 stations, the Chicago L gets talked about surprisingly little. And that's too bad, because the system is incredibly interesting and storied. In many ways, Chicago and its Rust Belt rapid transit system feel like relics of a bygone time, with elevated tracks and small streetcar-derived cars crisscrossing the skyscraper city. But Chicago, like a number of historic rapid transit systems, still punches above its weight in many ways, with its quad-track express services and 24-hour service as well, something many of the world's great metro systems don't have. Chicago's substantial existing transit infrastructure is begging to be pushed further in the future. What I'm trying to say is that Chicago's transit system truly has the bones of a world-class system, not unlike New York, London, or Tokyo. At the same time, the city is already probably the best value transit city in the US. The rail system is miles better than Seattle, LA, or San Francisco, much less cities in the Sun Belt, and the city is substantially more affordable, which isn't common for a true world city. But what does its impressive elevated train system actually look like? Let's dive into it. If you like this video, make sure to like, subscribe for my future explainers and other transit content, and leave a comment with which city you think I should cover in the future. A special thanks to Brian, Steven, Austin, and Mika for helping with this video. The first thing we should do as always is get situated in Chicago. Chicago is a Great Lakes city. The city lies at the southern tip of Lake Michigan, which its urban fringe begins to wrap around. Looking at the central city, the densest areas of Chicago are near the Chicago River in particular, in the corner formed by the main branch and the south branch of the river in an area known as the Loop. To the east of this, you have the massive Grant Park, which includes within it a ton of stuff, including Millennium Park and the Bean. It's a very nice urban park, but it has too many roads running through it. About 10 kilometers or 6.5 miles southeast of the Loop is the famous University of Chicago, while at the western end of the Loop, not far from the Chicago River, is the Sears Tower, now formally known as the Willis Tower, which was the tallest building in the world for almost a quarter century, and is one of my personal favorite buildings. Chicago has four main passenger rail terminals. LaSalle Street Station and Ogilvy Transportation Center serve commuter trains, while Chicago Union Station serves commuter trains as well as Amtrak intercity trains that include a number of long-distance cross-country services to locations like Seattle, Los Angeles, and New Orleans. The final central terminal, Millennium Station, is underneath Millennium Park, and serves Chicago's electric commuter rail services, as well as the South Shore Line services to South Bend, Indiana. Unfortunately, unlike many other cities with rapid transit, like Toronto, London, and Tokyo, rapid transit is often a short walk away from the main central stations rather than right inside. Of course, Chicago is well known for its major air hubs, which are both connected to the city's rapid transit system. Midway is 15 kilometers, or about 9 miles southwest of the Loop, and like a lot of Chicago, flies under the radar despite moving more than 20 million passengers a year pre-COVID, almost entirely on domestic US flights. Chicago's other major airport, O'Hare, is more well known. Built at the height of the jet age, the airport was the world's busiest for decades, and remains one of the busiest in the world. O'Hare is about 25 kilometers, or 16 miles, northwest of the Loop. Now, I mentioned the Loop in central Chicago, but you might be confused why it's called that. As it turns out, the origin of the name comes from the roughly 3km or 2 mile elevated rail loop which runs on Lake, Wabash, Van Buren, and Wells Streets, originally created by famous rail magnate Charles Yerkes in the late 1800s. The fact that an entire portion of the city is known based on a name derived from rapid transit infrastructure is pretty darn awesome. The infrastructure itself is of course incredibly unique among rapid transit systems, the only somewhat comparable example in my opinion being Melbourne's underground commuter rail loop. In total, the Loop has 8 stations, though it did have more historically, and yes, it absolutely is what comes to mind when most people hear of the Chicago L. The elevated tracks that form the Loop are obviously iconic, but they're not limited to Chicago city center. A very large portion of Chicago's rapid transit system does run elevated on steel viaducts that sometimes straddle roadways, hence its famous name. Unlike most modern elevated concrete guideways, this allows most stations and rail infrastructure to exist entirely over existing rights of way, but at the cost of being a bit visually imposing, despite not being entirely solid and allowing some light to filter down to street level. It is worth noting that most of Chicago's L's don't actually operate over public streets, but over private rights of way, sometimes along laneways bought up from property owners. If you're wondering how trains manage the tight corners necessitated by this approach, and all over the place in Chicago, that's thanks to their streetcar origins, which leaves even the most modern Chicago L cars at less than 15 meters or 50 feet long. 
quite small by modern rapid transit standards and only a little longer than a city bus. Of course, while the look might not be popular in other cities, it's really been embraced by Chicago as an integral part of theirs. One of the main benefits of the loop is that it actually brings trains into the city center, with stations a short walk from all of Chicago's four major central terminal stations, a role which has played since its inception, which was as a way to bring rapid transit trains and even more long distance interurbans from places like Milwaukee that would have formerly gone to terminals outside of the core directly into the city center. What's much less appreciated is that Chicago's busiest rapid transit services actually don't use the loop at all. Under central Chicago and the Chicago River run two rapid transit tunnels, known as the State Street and Milwaukee-Dearborn subways, which were built in the mid-20th century as part of the New Deal. These two subways run a short distance apart, north-south through the loop, and provide connections to the elevated stations, including a fully indoor integrated connection at Clark and Lake to the Blue Line. With all of this groundwork out of the way, let's start taking a look at the lines of the L, right after a message from today's sponsor, NordPass. As a young person living in a digital age, I have accounts on basically every single website I visit frequently, including social media sites and online stores, and there's simply no way for anyone, really, to be able to come up with a different secure password for every single one of them and actually remember them for the next time. That's why I use NordPass, a secure vault that helps me generate and store strong passwords so I can protect my accounts. With NordPass, I can easily retrieve my passwords on up to six different devices, and autofill them into my apps, so I don't even have to type them out. With NordPass being a zero-knowledge password manager, no one else but me can see what's inside my encrypted vault. And I can sleep safe knowing my accounts and identity won't be stolen. I seriously recommend that if you aren't using a password manager, you consider giving NordPass a try. Get exclusive access to NordPass's best offer at nordpass.com slash rmtransit, or use code rmtransit at checkout for an extra month free. Now, back to the video. We'll start with the lines that run through the subways, the blue and red lines. The Blue Line has 33 stops over 43 kilometers or 27 miles of track, making it the longest line in the system. The line runs from O'Hare Airport at the northwest, along freeway medians and elevated to the entrance of the Milwaukee-Dearborn subway, which the line runs through, crossing under the Chicago River before turning west south of the loop and running west along highway and railway rights of way to its terminus. The Red Line also has 33 stops over 42 kilometers or 26 miles of track, making it just slightly shorter than the Blue Line. That being said, the Red Line is the most heavily used line on the Chicago L. Starting in the south at 95th Street, the Red Line runs north in the center of the Dan Ryan Expressway, which it exits around 26th Street, before transitioning into the State Street subway, which it runs along north through the loop and under the Chicago River. The Red Line pops out onto the now quad-track Northside Main Line south of Fullerton Station as its center two tracks, and continues along the elevated structure all the way to Howard. A very cool feature of the Red Line is that it connects both Wrigley and Guaranteed Rate fields, making it the premier transport mode fueling the awesome Cubs and White Sox crosstown rivalry. Both the Red and Blue Lines run 24 hours a day year-round, which is a nice idea for other cities. Even if you can't make every line 24 hours, at least consider making the most popular ones so. Perhaps in Toronto, that could look like running the Young Line alone 24 hours a day. The main stretch of the Purple Line is a 9-stop, 6.5km or 4-mile route which runs north from Howard, the terminus of the Red Line, through a major yard before running up to Evanston and beyond to Linden. Now, the Purple Line does have a trick up its sleeve, and that's that during peak times it runs south towards the Loop as an express train on the outer tracks of the Northside Main Line. South of Armitage Station, the Red Line dives into the State Street subway, leaving the Purple Line on a two-track elevated corridor which weaves its way southeast, until it crosses the Chicago River and arrives at the northwestern corner of the Loop, which it runs around clockwise before returning north. The junction at the northwestern corner of the Loop is really interesting, being quite certainly the only three-quarter union junction on any rapid transit system. The Yellow Line, sometimes known as the Skokie Swift, is the least used line on the L, and is just 8 kilometers or 4.5 miles long. It's also the only line on the system which doesn't run into central Chicago. As with the Purple Line, the Yellow Line starts at Howard, running west. From here, the line is mostly on a surface corridor with level crossings to Skokie. Interestingly, in the not-so-distant past, trains on the Yellow Line actually operated using overhead line electrification, and infrastructure for this is still visible along the line. The Brown Line operates its 27-stop, 18km or 11.5-mile service beginning in the Loop, operating in a counterclockwise direction before crossing the Chicago River and heading north on track shared with the Purple Line. The two services operate together before meeting the Red Line and continuing north to Belmont Station. Historically, north of Belmont, Brown Line trains would diverge west, crossing over the various tracks on the Northside Main Line at grade, causing operational delays. However, quite recently in 2021, a new project known as the Red Purple Bypass opened, creating a new flyover that allows Brown Line trains heading north to cross above the tracks used by the Red and Purple Lines. A really excellent project. 
From here, the line continues northwest before heading down to Grade, just east of Rockwell Station. This leaves the last kilometer and a half of the line to Kimball with a number of grade crossings. Kimball is a station I really like because of the way it's grade level terminating platforms and right near the street, making the station one of the few rapid transit stops you can walk right into and onto a train without going up or down any stairs. The Green Line has a total of 30 stops on 33 kilometers or 20 miles of track. The line starts in the west, running on an embankment next to mainline rail tracks, before shifting onto an L, which the service runs along all the way to the northwest corner of the loop, passing right over the Chicago River. From here, the line runs along the north side of the loop, connecting to the blue and red lines, and then turns south on the east side of the loop. The green line exits the loop to the south from the southeast corner. The green line is the only line which enters the loop, but doesn't loop around the loop. From the loop south, tracks continue elevated directly between a series of high-rise buildings and then further south past Washington Park, and the adjacent University of Chicago, where the line splits into two branches. The eastern branch continues self-elevated before turning east to terminate at Cottage Grove and 63rd Street. The western branch turns to cross the Dan Ryan Expressway before continuing further west and south as an L. The pink line has 18 kilometers or 11 miles of track with 22 stations. Starting running around the loop clockwise, the pink line exits the loop at its northwest corner alongside the green line, running over the Chicago River and all the way to just past Ashland Station, where the pink line turns to the south, passing by the United Center Stadium where the Chicago Bulls and Blackhawks play, without any stop. Just south of here, the pink line actually crosses the blue line, again without any station connection, but with a track connection. The pink line continues south, elevated before turning west around 21st Street and continuing. The line descends to surface level with a grade crossing just east of Costner Station. From here, the line continues at grade to 54th Cermak, a terminal station with a very unique double berthing platform. The orange line has 21 kilometers or 12 miles of track with a total of 16 stops. The surface starts by circling around the loop before continuing south through its southeastern corner alongside the green line. Now, the orange line diverges from the green line to the west around West 18th Street using a series of tracks that also allows trains south from the loop to travel onto the red line. Continuing west-southwest, the orange line descends to run next to mainline rail tracks, which it continues along, using a short elevated guideway to hop from one rail corridor to another, which the line does again to the west of Kedzie, before turning south to terminate at Midway Airport. Now, as you can probably tell, the L is a big system, and Chicago is a famous city, so you're probably expecting a lot of expansion projects. And on this, I have good news and bad news. The good news is that Chicago is doing a ton of projects to improve the L. The most notable improvement project on the system is the RPM, or Red Purple Modernization. This project is rebuilding quadrack sections of the north side mainline, which are old and quite deteriorated, with new, modern concrete viaducts akin to what you would see on a modern rapid transit system, while at the same time completely renovating a number of stations. This project is a really big deal, because I can see Chicago replicating it across a massive portion of its network, eventually transforming what are often century-old pieces of infrastructure into something modern. At the same time, stations across the system are slowly being refreshed and made accessible, and the system is actually fairly decent on this front, especially compared to New York, with over 70% of stations being fully accessible. Major station rebuilds do also happen every so often, with Belmont on the north side mainline for example receiving a nice rebuild in the 2000s, and Washington Wabash on the loop being constructed to replace two existing stations in the 2010s, complete with the design that sets the bar high for future rebuilds, such as the one occurring in the coming years at State and Lake, the busiest station on the L. Some existing stations on the red line will also see their platforms extended to accommodate 140 meter long 10 car trains. All lines on the system except for the purple line and yellow line can currently accommodate 8 car trains. The purple line can accommodate 6 car trains, while the yellow line can accommodate 4. Chicago has also built a lot of new infill stations over the year, which can be much more practical when your system has few underground segments. Speaking of trains, Chicago is getting a large number of new trains known as the 7000 series, which are being manufactured by CRRC in the US. Like the currently in service L cars, the 7000 series will come in two car married pairs with 14 meter cars with two doors per side. While the 7000 series does have a more modern fascia than current L cars and nicer internal digital wayfinding, the lack of fully interconnected open gangway trains feels like a missed opportunity, especially for the red and blue lines. Of course, Chicago is quite unique among historic rapid transit systems in only featuring a single train standard, influenced by the shared loop in Chicago's center. Now, I mentioned good news and bad news, so what's the bad news? Well, Chicago, despite its great size, is only building one major capital expansion, and while very positive, the four-station, 9km, or 5.5 mile extension to the red line south to 130th Street, is nowhere near enough to meet Chicago's transportation needs. With O'Hare Airport getting billions and billions spent on its reconfiguration and expansion, the heavily used L should be seeing much more serious funding, 
which could go quite far given Chicago's projects tend to be less expensive than others in the US. Given more projects aren't officially on the books, I'm going to go out on a limb and briefly mention some projects that I think would be worth spending money on. The first project that would make a lot of sense would be moving block signaling, at least on the heavily used red line, where higher frequencies could be of serious use. After it's installed, you could do a rolling project to deploy it to other lines. Given Chicago's transit infrastructure is old, improved reliability and energy efficiency of modern CBTC would also likely be helpful. At the same time, I'd suggest modern rolling stock would fit well with the new signaling. 10-car interconnected sets, or at a minimum paired 5-car sets, could be deployed on the red line, with individual cars alternating between rapid transit and commuter-style seating layouts, and 3 or 2-door arrangements. Of course, more major revamps and reconstructions would also be great. While accessibility is an important first target, given the age of many L stations and their relatively easy to replace elevated designs, complete modern rebuilds of more stations would be a positive. Thinking a little bigger, and giving my thoughts as a foreign observer, Chicago could probably also benefit from some new corridors. In the city center, an east-west subway, perhaps carrying the brown line, could provide more capacity, while also running north and east to access areas not directly served by rapid transit, like New East Side and Streeterville. An extension of the brown line west of the blue line would also provide some valuable suburban connectivity. Given the massive importance of O'Hare, some sort of express service should absolutely be a priority, and it surprises me that it wasn't built as part of the airport's massive recent projects. Whether that's a mainline rail connection or express tracks on the blue line, clearly as one of the busiest airports in the world, O'Hare could probably have more than one rail service and should to remain competitive. The final obvious project for Chicago to build is some sort of circumferential loop or crosstown line. Now, leave it up to the locals to decide where the best corridors for this will be, but I think given Chicago's highly suburbanized nature and the incredibly radial existing rapid transit network, such a line could unlock a ton of ridership. It could also be mostly constructed elevated, something the city is well versed in, and at the same time, since Chicago's trains are already quite small and flexible, it could utilize the same standards for greater economies of scale with the existing system. Now, I know you come to these videos for the fun and interesting features, and on this, Chicago does not disappoint. As you might have figured, with significant parts of the L already being open in the early 1900s, the system is one of the oldest rapid transit systems in the world. And even more interesting, Charles Yerkes, who as I mentioned earlier was critical in getting the loop built, actually went on to play a big role in the London Underground. Jago Hazard has a bunch of great content that talks about this. Another feature of the L that's really nice is the next train arrival signs not just on platforms but outside of stations, which make it clear if you should run into the station to catch the next train or if you can take your time. I mentioned earlier the streetcar and interurban origins of the L, but it's worth highlighting elements which were probably influenced by this history. For example, the overhead wire power seen on the yellow line, the tiny cars, the grade crossings. You can also see a lot of yards have loops or their remnants. A lot of yards on the L are also just truly unconventional. Highway median yard? Check. Yard across from an airport terminal? Check. Yard built on a giant elevated platform? Check. This whole video has been about rail, but it is worth mentioning that like Toronto, Chicago's buses operate in a grid and move more people than the connected rail system, though they do operate less frequently than they probably should. Quite unique as well, and reminiscent of the New York subway, is the north side main line with its quad track local express services, though they are organized with local on the inside rather than the outside, which is more common in New York. Chicago also has its 24-hour rail services every day, something I and most other people with metro systems in their cities are probably jealous of, and historically even more of the system featured 24-hour service. Something you'll also see in Chicago that isn't nearly as common in other places is a lot of abandoned infrastructure. The L is dotted with old and disused stations as well as corridors, and at times even existing stations can feel very weird and dated. For example, the wooden platforms seen at many L stops are not something you see on many contemporary systems, nor are the long ramps down to highway median stations seen for example on the blue line. Something else which is super strange are the extremely long multi-station platforms seen on the State Street subway, which allow for walking several station lengths on the platforms, and for trains to modify their stopping positions, sort of like streetcars. This was apparently done to allow for staggering of trains when it congested stations, but I'll say it's also very good future-proofing for future longer trains. One thing I'm very thankful for with the L is that unlike almost every transit agency out there, Chicago CTA actually has uploaded POV videos of its various train lines, so you can not only get the fun experience of what it would be like to drive the trains, but you can also see tons of the infrastructure and abandoned stations really easily. So with that, Chicago. I've wanted to cover the city's rapid transit for a long time, and I hope the wait was worth it. Thanks for watching.